uh, taking time out of your evening to join us for um, a little webinar here about a topic that's um, near and dear to my heart, um, and that's hair transplant and the treatments that we have for hair loss. Um, there is a uh, two chat boxes running. Um, there's one chat box, which is just going to go to the host. And then there's a separate box um, for questions and answers. It's a Q&A box. Um, so if you guys have questions, we'd love to field and answer them. Um, if you guys can go ahead and type your question into the Q&A box, um, everybody could see it that way. Um, and uh, with that, let's get started um, and learn a little bit more about hair transplant and um, treatments that we have for hair loss. Um, so I have no financial disclosures to make, um, and uh, I want to start the talk about um, uh, talk with uh, just why should we worry about hair loss um, in the first place? And to do that, um, I think it's uh, helpful to take some lessons from the past. So uh, this is an image of the Ebers papyrus, um, and uh, this Ebers papyrus was um, written and uh, created back in ancient Egypt around 1500 BCE. And it contains a couple recipes for hair loss. Um, so it recommends uh, for hair loss to put together the fat of a lion, hippopotamus, crocodile, cat, and snake. Um, and you would rub that over the areas that are thinning. Um, but if that didn't work, it suggested um, then mixing together the burn spikes of a hedgehog with fingernails, honey, alabaster, and red ochre. Um, if we fast forward into the future to about 300, 70 uh, BC, um, we come upon Hippocrates, who's um, uh, called the father of modern medicine, and the Hippocratic Oath is attributed to him. Now, Hippocrates um, also struggled with hair loss, as you can see from the bust of his head here. Um, and in order to try to combat this hair loss, um, he made some astute observations. Number one, that eunuchs don't go bald, and we'll um, kind of get into that when we talk about the mechanism of hair loss. Um, and he also came up with his own balm recipe um, to try to combat this hair loss, and that consisted of mixing together opium, horseradish, pigeon droppings, beetroot, and cumin. Um, but this didn't work for him either, and his hair loss uh, continued to recede so that he was just left with a narrow strip of hair here at the back of the head, um, and that's been named the Hippocratic wreath in his honor. Um, so if we fast forward a little bit more into the future, um, uh, to about 44 AD, uh, we meet Julius Caesar, and he's often depicted wearing this wreath of laurels around his head. Um, and uh, it's thought that he wore this wreath to cover his receding hairline. Um, Cleopatra, who he was uh, famously um, with, also came up with a recipe for his uh, for his receding hair. Um, and she uh, decided to grind up some mice, horse teeth, and bear grease. Um, but this also didn't work. And it's said that Julius Caesar eventually would grow his hair long in the back and uh, flip this hair over to the front to cover his receding hairline um, in what could be the very first comb over described. So um, that's the past, where are we today? Um, we're still really interested in hair loss today and there's still a lot of research going on um, to try to slow hair loss and to regenerate hair. Um, here's a science article I read about, again, referencing Hippocrates, why uni eunuchs don't go bald. Um, and uh, here's a YouTube search I did, which showed some homemade remedies um, to thicken hair and to help hair to grow thicker. Um, in 2016 alone, we spent three and a half billion dollars across the globe on cures for hair loss. Um, this is more than the national budget of Macedonia at the time, and more than what we at the time spent on control of malaria. And Propecia, which is a medication I'll talk about, um, which is helpful for uh, stabilizing hair loss and reversing some of the um, effects of receding hairlines, um, those sales were at 264 million in 2014. So um, I like to start uh, this um, uh, part of the talk with a little background about hair loss evaluation, because I think treating hair loss is more than uh, just a cosmetic endeavor. Um, hair loss is also a medical problem that occurs, and there can be um, underlying 
causes of hair loss that we can't really transplant. Um, and those causes would uh, deserve a referral to a dermatologist or um, internal medicine or OBGYN. So we have to start with really evaluating the hair loss as best that we can. And um, we start by um, asking specific details and um, trying to get a story about the specific hair loss that's been going on. So um, we like to ask how long it's been going on um, for women, uh, ponytail size is a good question we can ask to get an idea of how much thinning is occurring in the hair. Um, so about 50% of hair loss um, is the threshold uh, where, whereby we can start to see some uh, decrease in the size of the ponytail or notice some uh, thinning. We also ask if there's been any shedding recently. So um, have there been clumps or um, collection of hair that you see on your pillow, in the kitchen, on the bathroom floor? Um, this can help kind of give us an idea of whether or not this hair loss is happening suddenly or if it's something more gradual. Um, patterns of loss. Are you getting hair loss all over the scalp or is it just in in small areas, in the frontal area, the little triangles to the side of the front of the face? Um, is there any itching, burning, or pain? This could indicate that there could be um, inflammation going on or uh, infection that would need to be treated. Um, how somebody styles their hair is also very important. Um, do, do you use curling iron, straightening irons, perms? Um, what kind of chemical hair products do you use? All of these products can um, really uh, damage the hair shaft. And um, we also like to ask how people wear their hair. Do they wear it in a tight bun? Do you wear tight braids? All of this can cause pulling on the hair and can also cause hair to fall out. And then lastly, we always like to get a sense of who else in the family has hair loss, um, both women and men in the family, because this is a problem that affects both genders. And then how much hair loss um, did they get? And that gives us an idea of how the hair loss is going to progress. Um, so after that, we proceed to an examination of hair, um, and we want to look at the overall scalp from a distance and more globally looking at the distribution of hair, the hair color, how long the hair is, whether there are any eyebrows or eyelashes. Um, and then we follow this up with a more close up examination using um, a little dermatoscope. Um, and this allows us to see in high magnification um, the quality of the scalp itself, whether there's any scarring or um, if there's no scarring, if there's any redness, um, and if there's any miniaturization of the hairs, which we'll talk about shortly. So um, we're going to talk now about uh, patterned hair loss. Um, this is also called male pattern baldness, um, but this is a type of hair loss that also affects women and it uh, can be just as devastating in women as well. Um, and the scientific name for this is androgenetic alopecia, but all of these terms refer to the same type of hair loss. Um, so patterned hair loss is the most common type of hair loss. We know that androgens like testosterone play an important role in this type of hair loss. And in men, it tends to affect the frontal area, the sides of the scalp and the crown. And in women, um, as you'll see, it kind of manifests in a more diffuse spread out pattern in the crown. Um, so this diagram um, kind of shows what's going on when we have hair loss. So globally, you can see when, you, um, when hair is healthy and strong, um, that's uh, um, depicted here on the left, um, it's nice and thick, it's growing long. But um, as patterned hair loss starts to take place, you can see the hair follicle itself and the hair shaft gets progressively more and more miniaturized until eventually um, it stops growing altogether. And um, these little blue red dots in the scalp diagram here are kind of describing what's going on on a molecular level. Um, so the blue dots refer to testosterone. These gold squiggly lines refer to an enzyme in the scalp, which converts this testosterone to a molecule called dihydrotestosterone. And that's represented by these little red dots. Um, and at the base of the hair follicle are these little receptors, which um, are represented by this horseshoe shaped uh, green structure here. And what happens is uh, when pa patterned hair loss starts, um, basically uh, dihydrotestosterone, which is this red molecule will bind to the receptor and that will um, cause this hair to start shrinking and miniaturizing. 
So what we want to do with our medical treatments is we want to try to reverse this process. So instead of miniaturizing, we want to try to reverse the miniaturization. And any hairs that are still young and healthy, we want to keep them young and healthy and prevent them from undergoing this process. So male pattern hair loss is um, often classified using the Norwood classification. Um, you can see on the, the left, upper left here, um, this is a young gentleman without any evidence of hair loss. And then the most severe type of hair loss is Norwood 7. Um, and this is, uh, if you remember that bust from Hippocrates, just uh, what's um, what's remaining is really just this small horseshoe strip of hair in the back. Um, and this is important because this strip of hair, even in the most severe hair loss, um, is going to remain uh, remain there and remain healthy, and and that's the the um, the concept that we use when we try to do hair transplant. So female hair loss, um, there are several scales. I'm going to talk about um, the Ludwig scale and the Hamilton scale. Um, so the Ludwig scale is here on the right. Right, um, as you notice, women tend to um, lose more diffusely in this crown area. Um, according to the Ludwig classification, they will re remain, retain this frontal fringe of hair here, and the severity depends on how much uh, hair has been lost. Women can also lose hair um, in a similar pattern like men do, and so um, in those cases, you see these recessions in the frontotemporal regions here that eventually progress to a similar uh, Ludwig scale. And here's an image of a woman with um, diffuse hair loss in the crown, um, and you can see how that pattern is different from how men lose their hair. Another way we describe female hair loss um, is we, we describe it in a Christmas tree pattern. So this woman, you can see she's lost more of her frontal um, hairline here, and she her hair kind of resembles a Christmas tree with more scalp show here at the base and then more density as we go higher up along the tree. And um, it looks like an, a triangle and, and, and a Christmas tree. Um, so that is patterned hair loss, um, what we commonly known as uh, what we commonly refer to in society as male pattern baldness. Um, but I'm going to talk just very, very briefly about unpatterned hair loss um, because it's important to try to diagnose these when we can um, because these uh, types of hair loss may not necessarily be great um, uh, candidates for hair transplantation. So we divide unpatterned hair loss into either a scarring type of hair loss or a non-scarring type of hair loss. Um, for non-scarring types of hair loss, this can be due to underlying medical problems like iron deficiency. Um, this woman here has polycystic ovarian disease, um, which is a disease of hormones um, and your hormone levels um, get altered in the body. So treatment for her would be first to stabilize the polycystic ovarian disease before we consider um, any other hair procedures. Telogen effluvium um, is a type of global shedding that can happen after any stressor. So um, what's commonly described are women who are pregnant right after they give birth. They can globally shed a lot of hair, um, and that's telogen effluvium. Um, it's important to note that it's telogen effluvium because all the hair will grow back, um, and a transplant would not be a wise choice um, because given a few months, um, the woman will have a full head of hair again. Autoimmune diseases can also cause non-scarring hair loss. Um, so this is a patient with alopecia areata or alopecia totalis, um, and you can see she's lost hair over her entire scalp and also in um, her eyebrows here. And then lastly, there can be hair loss due to trauma. Um, so this is a woman who um, wears her hair pulled back very tightly, and you can see where her natural hairline used to be. Um, but because of the constant traction on the hair, um, it's pulled the hairs and, and actually caused the hair to fall out. Um, so it's important, uh, you know, when, when seeing this type of hair loss to counsel on changing um, the type of hair practices and changing how you wear your hair. Um, some people have a condition called trichotillomania, um, and what that means is uh, they, they self-pluck their hair um, and they do it repetitively. It's, it's um, a little bit of a, a obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and so those patients need to be referred for therapy, um, transplanting those regions will not solve um, the underlying problem. And then I also like to get an idea of what kind of hair products they use. Um, this is the, a 
diagram of um, a hair shaft under high magnification, and you can see the hair obviously broke at this point here. Um, these are little nodes that develop and they become weak points in the hair. They can be caused by certain hairstyling practices, so um, that's also important to note. Um, and then scarring hair loss, um, there can be lots of reasons for scarring hair loss. Infection is one reason. Um, this gentleman had uh, folliculitis and a severe infection of his scalp, and you can see he's um, got a lot of scarring in the scalp, and he's lost a lot of hair over the regions that were affected. Um, frontal fibrosing alopecia is a condition that often affects women and can be easily mistaken for patterned hair loss. Um, it's important to pick these patients out. Um, when in doubt, always biopsy. But you can see um, this case is more obvious. Not all cases are going to be this obvious. Um, uh, but you can see her, her uh, scalp looks shiny and the skin looks kind of thin um, and atrophied. It doesn't look like strong, healthy scalp. And if you look um, at the hair follicles themselves, uh, if you catch somebody in an active uh, inflammatory state, you'll see kind of redness around the hair follicle, which um, indicates an inflammation going on. Um, and lastly, there can be cancers of the scalp. Um, cancers are either cut out, um, and if they are cut out, we lose all the hair follicles that used to be there. Um, cancers can also be radiated, um, and of course, radiation can also scar and damage um, healthy normal tissue. And so these are also types of scarring hair loss. So um, now we'll move into uh, talking about, we'll talk about first um, medical or non-surgical therapies for hair loss, and then we'll talk about hair transplant um, uh, uh, and um, types of considerations we make in hair transplant. Um, so I thought to talk about non-surgical treatments for hair loss, we'd start um, kind of simple. So um, there are tons of products over the counter which are camouflaging hair products. And um, what they are are plant fibers um, that when you shake them onto areas that are thinning, the plant fiber is basically attached to whatever existing hair is there. And it covers up the area and gives this illusion of um, density uh, over the thinning area. So you can see this gentleman here, he's got diffuse thinning in the frontal region, mid frontal mid scalp, and also in the vertex here. And he just um, kind of like a salt shaker, salt and pepper, um, shakes some of this uh, plant fiber over the thinning areas. And you can see you can get um, the illusion of coverage. Um, these results are temporary. The fibers wash away with shower and shampoo. Um, and people who might be interested in this are uh, men and women who are looking to camouflage their hair loss. Maybe there's a special event you have to go to um, or you want to camouflage um, your hair loss for work, for important meetings. Um, this would be a good temporary option. Um, after hair transplant, uh, people will experience some shock loss. Um, and while the shock, when the shock loss happens, it takes three to four months for the hair to grow back. So during that period, um, using these camouflaging hair products might be a good option to hide um, the thinning while the hair is growing back. Um, Rogaine is a medication that um, almost uh, everybody uh, who comes for hair evaluation um, has already tried or is well aware of. Um, the generic name for Rogaine is minoxidil, um, and minoxidil was first given in the 1970s as an oral medication for high blood pressure. Um, and the way minoxidil works is it increases the proportion of hair in um, antigen, which is the healthy growing hair of uh, growing phase of um, the hair follicle. Um, it also increases the average hair thickness, and um, the mechanism uh, is. Uh, binding to some pot potassium channels. Um, and you can see uh, in this simple diagram here, you have a healthy terminal hair and we have um, a miniaturized vellus hair. Rogaine is again trying to reverse this process um, by uh, increasing the thickness of these vellus hairs and trying to um, convert them into terminal hairs. Um, for men, Rogaine comes in a 5% formulation for women, it comes in a 2 to 5% formulation. Um, the foam version of uh, Rogaine has a smaller um, incidence of allergies or itchy scalp. Um, and the liquid formulation has a higher um, a chance of um, itchy scalp and allergies. Um, but uh, really, which formulation you choose um, will depend on. Sorry, let me turn on turn the lights back on here. 
Um, which formulation you choose uh, will depend on um, what you find to be most convenient and most easy to use. Um, you apply the product to your scalp directly. We want the product to get to the scalp so that it can infiltrate the hair follicle where it's going to take effect. Um, and then after you apply it, you just want to let the um, Rogaine soak in. So don't shower, don't expose your scalp to water for four hours after application. Um, I always tell people hair growth takes time. Um, it's not something that happens in just a matter of weeks. Um, and so uh, a lot of um, hair restoration also has to come with patience. And so it takes maybe about three to four months before you can start seeing some hair growth. So um, before you write it off, make sure um, you give it a good three to six months of use before, um, before we decide it doesn't work. Um, finasteride um, is a medication that we can give uh, to try to stabilize and reverse hair loss as well. Um, it is a prescription only medication and it is the same medication that we gave for uh, enlarged prostate glands. Um, I included this diagram here um, because uh, I wanted to illustrate where finasteride works. So finasteride inhibits the action of this uh, enzyme here that converts testosterone to DHT. Um, and you can see uh, in this little blow up um, uh, version of the diagram, finasteride stops this conversion of testosterone. Um, so uh, when we stop that conversion, we have fewer red molecules circulating. Um, and so we stop the uh, miniaturization process. So who should take it? Um, this is a medication primarily for men. Um, it can be given to some women, but um, they have to be uh, in, in menopause or post-menopause um, because it can be, it can affect uh, um, uh, pregnancy and can uh, lead to um, abnormalities in uh, baby, uh, the development of the fetus or the baby. And again, just like Rogaine, um, it will take some time for any change or visible change in your hair growth, and it will take maybe about four to six months for you to see any change um, in, in your hair growth and any increase in density or thickness. Um, this picture is taken of a set of twins from a a twin study that was done with finasteride. Um, so the identical twins were randomized to either get a placebo or to get this um, medication. And you can see the twin here on the right. Um, he has some thinning in the vertex, but compared to his identical twin, um, he's retained a lot more hair um, than his identical twin has. Um, more recently, uh, laser light therapy has become widely marketed. This is an FDA approved treatment for hair loss. Um, the capillus uh, cap is um, something that's been marketed widely over the internet, um, but it's easy to use. Um, there are no real side effects. The laser light is a very low wavelength light and it doesn't really burn the scalp. Um, and you can just put the cap on and um, wear it while you're cooking, while you're watching television, while you're reading a book, when you're taking a walk outside. Um, and uh, you typically wear the cap for 30 minutes at a time, about th three times a week or so. And um, it stimulates the hair follicles to grow as well. Again, just like with Rogaine and um, finasteride, it takes up to four months um, after starting for you to start to see results. <clears throat> and um, the results can continue for up to 12 months before it, it kind of stabilizes and um, no new growth happens. Um, so laser light therapy stimulates epidermal stem cells. Um, we also think that uh, it affects the cytochrome C, which is a molecule that's involved in program cell death. Um, and so it inhibits uh, the program cell death, which um, also helps to keep uh, hairs alive. And again, just like with finasteride, with laser, we're trying to reverse this process of hair miniaturization. Um, and you can see in some people, um, they can get excellent results with this treatment. Um, so platelet-rich plasma is a more recent treatment that we offer as well um, and which we provide. Again, PRP, just like laser, just like Rogaine, trying to reverse the miniaturization that happens in uh, patterned hair loss. So um, how do you know if PRP is right for you? Um, so PRP can be given for um, men and women who have early to moderate hair loss. Um, men and women who've noticed that their hair really isn't growing as well as it used to, um, they may have tried Rogaine's hair, Rogaine hair vitamins, 
um, laser therapies, um, and they notice some improvement, but they want to see if they can stimulate their hair growth anymore. Um, and platelet rich plasma is a good option to try in those cases. Um, and in patients who have had hair transplant, the actual transplanted hairs are permanent, but um, you have to keep in mind that the hairs around the transplanted hairs, the native hairs in that area are still going to undergo um, gradual thinning over time. So um, even after a transplant, we can use platelet rich plasma to help um, uh, slow the progression of hair loss over time. So um, the procedure is uh, done in clinic. It's about a one to one and a half hour procedure. Um, you come in, what we do is we um, numb you up. So we uh, numb up the scalp so that there isn't any tenderness during the treatment. Um, and we draw your blood, spin it down in a centrifuge. <clears throat> And once we spin it down, it's going to separate into um, different layers. Um, so there's a platelet poor layer, platelet rich layer, and then the heaviest molecules, the um, cells, are going to drop to the bottom. So we basically isolate this platelet rich layer and we inject it back into the scalp. Again, um, results take time to show. Um, they can show as early as four months, but may take up to six months for you to see any results. And the results can continue to improve for up to 12 months and then again reach a steady state and plateau. Um, we typically start you with uh, three treatments based one, one month apart. So for the first three months, you'll get one treatment a month. Um, and then after the first three months, we can do a maintenance treatment every six months. Um, but that frequency really depends on you as the individual um, and how much, how quickly your hair loss is progressing, how stable it is, um, uh, that, that will determine the frequency of the maintenance treatments. Um, so this image was taken from uh, Dr. Epstein, who um, I worked with in fellowship. He was my mentor um, and I, I uh, learned a lot about hair transplantation from him. Um, but this is uh, one of his patients who he treated with PRP. Um, she had alopecia areata, and you can see um, the dramatic improvement that she got with uh, PRP treatments. Um, this gentleman here, you can see he's got some increase in density. Um, he still has some thinning, um, but the PRP did uh, increase his density slightly. Um, and so there's obviously a range in results that we can get with PRP as well. Um, so that sums up the main and the most um, common non-surgical therapies that we prescribe for hair loss. Um, I'm going to move into talk about hair transplantation now. Um, so hair restoration started in the early 1900s when um, Passat experimented with rotating flaps of hair to cover areas that were thinning. Um, in the 1950s, uh, the handheld punch and the four millimeter plug graft um, made its appearance. And um, you can see here the four millimeter plug grafts that have been transplanted from the back of the scalp over to the thinning areas. And um, that's given that classic uh, unnatural and pluggy look. Um, if we fast forward to the future in the 1990s, um, we developed follicular unit transplantation. Um, and this allowed us to um, treat each follicular unit like a fine um, paintbrush stroke. And that allows us to create a more natural um, and feathered looking hairline. Um, in the early 2000s, um, instead of uh, taking these follicular units from a strip of hair that we excise, um, we developed follicular unit extraction in which we go in there and we punch out individual follicular units themselves. Um, I want to mention in the early 1970s, we also had some scalp reduction techniques. You can see these fancy flaps that surgeons had developed to advance the hairline. Unfortunately, these scalps, um, these kinds of reductions uh, resulted in really unnatural hairlines. You can see this scar widen. Um, and scalp scars do tend to widen in, um, in patients, and so it gave it a very unnatural look. Um, and these are uh, treatments that, uh, results that we can get <clears throat> using individual follicular unit transplantation. Um, so hair transplant, what is it? Um, so what we're doing in hair transplant is we're moving hairs from the back of, head, back of the head to thinning areas. Um, and remember when we uh, looked at Hippocrates' hair loss and also um, the most severe hair loss on that Norwood scale, um, people still maintain that strip of hair in the back. So um, that's where this donor dominance theory came from. So those hairs in the back are resistant to balding. 
And um, when we transplant them, those hairs will maintain those non-balding characteristics. So because of this, a hair transplant is permanent. When it's done correctly um, and we are able to keep the grafts healthy, um, we have them in good storage uh, solutions, we handle them atraumatically. When we have a low transection rate, um, more than 95% of hairs uh, will survive. Um, who is a candidate? Uh, men and women who have noticed that they have a slow loss of hair. Um, this hair loss, uh, furthermore, is due to the androgenic alopecia or the patterned hair loss um, that we mentioned. And men and women who have also tried medical therapy. Um, they've seen some improvement in their hair um, density, hair thickness. Um, they've stabilized their hair loss, but they want more coverage and they want a natural look. And hair transplant is an excellent option in these patients. Um, in follicular unit grafting, um, this is the procedure uh, where we excise a strip of hair from the back of the scalp. We then um, cut that hair into thin sheets and slivers that are one follicular unit thick. And then these follicular unit um, thick sheets then cut, get cut individually um, into one uh, follicular unit. And then we can trim this follicular unit further um, to get it ready for transplantation. And you can see a beautiful pear-shaped um, viable follicular unit here. And this is a two follicular unit graft. And this is a three follicular unit graft. Um, follicular unit extraction is done um, with a handheld punch. Um, these punches are typically motorized. Um, there are lots of brands um, and lots of different types of punches out there. Um, they get really fancy with rotation, with um, vacuum suction. Um, Neograft uh, is a machine that also suctions the um, follicular unit in uh, out and helps to atraumatically remove the graft. Um, the artist robot is also a type of follicular unit extraction. Um, and this is really what is used most often for hair transplant today. Um, and you can see there are benefits to doing follicular unit extraction. Um, uh, you can see the sites where the follicular units were extracted from heal pretty well. Um, there's no linear scar from a strip harvest procedure. Um, and in this patient, unless you were to look um, very carefully and count the number of hairs in the back of the head, you won't be able to tell that um, he really had any hair transplant done. Um, so, hairline design is also very important to consider um, when we're doing hair transplant. Um, these follicular unit grafts have allowed us to create a more natural hairline, but um, how you design it is still important. So, this man has, um, uh, has had a hair transplant, and you can see um, the results are better than what we can get with the four millimeter plug. Um, method. However, there's still kind of an unnatural look to this hairline because it's really straight and the transition from forehead skin to hairline is really abrupt. If we look at um, a real hairline, um, you can see there are a lot of irregularities and we need to create these irregularities when we're doing a transplant. So macro irregularity refers to um, the generalized undulation you see in the hairline if you were to look from farther away. So this um, soft rolling uh, white dotted line in the first half or the left, left side of this black dotted line um, shows that macro irregularity. Um, micro irregularity is the irregularity we see in the scalp when we look close up. And if you were to just look at your hairline in the mirror close up, you're going to see um, these little triangular regions that jut out from the hairline. Um, and that, that consists of the micro irregularity to the hairline that we have to establish. Um, where we set the frontotemporal angle, or this point here, is also important. You can see in this young boy, and in this middle-aged man, um, the frontotemporal uh, angle is the same, and it um, corresponds to a line drawn from the lateral canthus, which is our medical term for the corner of the eye. Um, if we draw a line straight up, that's where that frontotemporal angle should be. Um, how we design the frontal hairline is also important. You can see again in this young boy and in this middle-aged male, there is an upslope to the frontal hairline. Um, and that is very natural. In this gentleman here who had a hair transplant, um, it looks unnatural because unlike the photos above, there is a downslope to this frontal hairline, um, which is not a natural look. 
So hair transplant is done in the office. Um, it's done under just local anesthesia, which means um, lidocaine to, uh, that is injected to numb up the scalp. Um, it's a same day procedure um, and may require multiple sessions to um, get the coverage and the look that you want. Um, so after undergoing transplant, what happens? Um, some patients can get uh, significant swelling. Um, for patients who are undergoing their first transplant, they tend to get um, more swelling than if they had undergone um, had previously undergone a transplant before. Um, the swelling can extend all the way down to the eye, and you can get a really puffy look around the eye. Um, swelling happens usually two to three days after the transplant, um, so you may look fine for the first day and then slowly um, notice that you start to get swollen. We do give um, some steroids postoperatively to try to combat this and try to try to decrease the amount of swelling, um, but it may still occur. Um, you can also have bleeding after hair transplant. Um, we typically just ask you to take some gauze and hold just very gentle pressure over the area that's bleeding. And we also ask that you not take any aspirin, ibuprofen for one week before and one week after the transplant to minimize the risk of bleeding. Um, some patients may have numbness of the scalp after the transplant. Um, that's from uh, the hair transplant itself and the fact that we have to make multiple little sites um, for each individual hair follicle to go into. Um, this numbness uh, typically comes back, but in some people it can be permanent. Um, and so it's important to uh, mention that in the preoperative consultation um, as a potential risk of the procedure. Um, you'll notice after the hair transplant, scabs will form around the individual implantation sites. Um, and they'll take typically five to 10 days to fall out. Um, what a lot of people are uh, concerned about is the shock loss that happens after a hair transplant. Um, you can get loss of hair from, number one, the transplanted hairs themselves are going to fall out, but the follicle will remain and grow. And um, the pre-existing hair where you're transplanting, um, those hairs um, can also thin and start shedding. Um, this typically happens within the first two to three weeks after the transplant. And typically um, it takes about three to four months for all of the hair to grow back. Um, it takes, again, uh, hair grows slowly, so it takes about one year for full results to be appreciated. Um, so this is a gentleman who had 2,000 grafts to the frontal region. You can see there's a nice um, reestablishment of his hairline. Um, in women, uh, we also um, do hair transplantation to reestablish a more youthful hairline. So this woman had her hairline moved forward. Um, this woman had density restored to the scalp. Um, and these are common types of hair transplant we do in women. Um, eyebrow hair transplant is also something that we do. Um, uh, the trend now is to have thick, healthy um, eyebrows, and uh, this is a nice um, uh, procedure we can do to give that thick um, and healthy look to the eyebrows. And then more and more men are also asking for hair transplant for the beard um, these days. Uh, you can see some men um, have uh, very distribution of where facial hair grows, um, and they may desire um, a specific pattern to the beard, um, and uh, we can work with them to reestablish that. So, in conclusion, um, hair restoration techniques have progressed um, significantly in the last 100 years. Um, hair transplantation is a safe procedure. There are few complications, and we easily perform this in the office setting. Um, in addition to hair transplant, we have really good medical options to kind of stabilize the hair loss um, and even restore some of the density um, for somebody who's been uh, thinning quite a bit. Um, and hair transplant is a pretty versatile technique. Um, before we open the forum to questions and before we answer the questions in the Q&A session, I wanted to thank you all again for joining us for this webinar. Um, we would like to uh, offer a free hair consultation and 10% off of either a PRP um, series, so it's a series of three treatments, um, or a hair transplant. Um, and uh, if you would like to take advantage of that, um, please call our office and mention that you were a webinar attendee when you call to schedule the appointment. And with that, I'll open the forum to any questions. Um, and uh, I'll shift it right here. Dr. Cal, we have a question that came in through the chat. I'm not sure that you can see it, but I'll, I'll read it to you. Okay. 
It says, I had cosmetic surgery six months ago and have noticed a significant increase in my hair loss. Uh, can, can the hair loss be fixed? If so, is there a treatment for this? Yes. Um, what kind of cosmetic surgery did you have? Um, it, it doesn't, guess, it doesn't say. Oh my God, we're not doing a real interview here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so you could have hair loss after the cosmetic surgery because the surgery could have been a stressful event. And so if you're noticing more global hair loss, that could be something more like a telogen effluvium, um, in which case, yes, the hair loss can recover. Um, we can help to speed things along. Sorry, let me, I have a time to, uh, Lighten here. We can help to speed along the recovery by starting you on Rogaine, um, hair vitamins, and trying to increase um, the uh, positive environment for hair to grow. Um, there are other types of hair loss um, where, uh, you know, if there was a facelift or a brow lift, um, there can actually be hair loss along a scar where the incision was. Um, and that, in those cases of hair loss, um, if the hair follicles um, are, are damaged or gone, we can't recover them, but um, we can transplant into the scar, scarring of the hairline and kind of camouflage the scar and um, make it look more natural as well. And we had the type of procedure, it was a tummy tuck. Oh, a tummy tuck. So probably was just um, the stress of surgery and um, that will probably recover. I'd be happy to see you in clinic, um, take a look at the hair under the microscope um, and see if we see uh, any indications for scarring or if we just see a global loss that would be more consistent with a stress induced um, hair loss that will recover on its own. Uh, we also have another uh, question. Uh, can cholesterol and blood pressure medication either together or by themselves cause hair loss? This happened after taking both meds after less than one year. I am 71 Vietnamese. By re research stated, only 1% seem to be in that category. Yes, um, there are lots of medications that can cause hair loss. Um, there is a very, very long list, and there are some blood pressure medications and cholesterol medications on that list. Um, I would say um, in those instances, again, I'm happy to see you in clinic again, take a look at the hair. Um, there might be also some miniaturization that we can um, improve with Rogaine. Um, but in those cases, I think it's um, helpful to go back and work with your primary care doctor to see if there's a different type of blood pressure medication you can try. Um, that may not uh, cause as much hair loss. And uh, we have got a couple of questions asking for the contact phone number again. So do you want yes. to give that too? Yes, uh, the phone number is 713-486-5019. And I can share my screen again um, and uh, flash that slide for you guys. Um, while I'm answering questions. I'll put it in the in the chat too. Okay. Um, we have another question. Are Rogaine and Propecia advisable for men with naturally low testosterone who are taking prescriptions for testosterone and estrogen regulation? Right, so um, if you're already taking prescriptions for testosterone, um, I would uh, be, I would hold off on the Propecia and would start the Rogaine first. Um, so Propecia has um, been shown to cause some uh, sexual side effects. Um, the risks of those uh, side effects are low and I actually have a slide um, showing the numbers. So let me share that with you. Let me first share my screen. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, so, uh, in this randomized controlled trial with um, uh, comparing, oops, um, comparing finasteride and placebo, um, you can see the rates of um, participants who reported a decreased libido. So, 1.8% versus 1.3% for those taking placebo. So, very little difference. Um, this was not statistically significant. Um, erectile dysfunction, 1.3% in the finasteride group, group versus 0.7% in the placebo group. Um, again, this wasn't statistically significant. Um, and there's also decreased ejaculate volume, so it's 0.8% versus 0.4% in the placebo group. Also not statistically significant. However, if you were to add all of the side effects together um, in the finasteride group versus the placebo group, there was a statistically significant difference um, in these side effects. Um, most of these side effects resolve in 58% of individuals. 
the medication is cleared by the liver and kidneys. So um, it would be good to um, get the family, get your family care doctor involved to make sure um, we monitor the liver and kidneys. Um, and in postmenopausal women who we start on um, on Propecia finasteride, uh, we do recommend monitoring for breast cancer. And if there is a family history of breast cancer, we don't recommend starting finasteride um, in these uh, in these women. Um, an, great. Another question. Does the laser plasma or transplant work for black men? Yes, they do. Um, so, uh, laser um, definitely works. I would um, certainly uh, encourage you to try um, laser. Uh, PRP also works. Um, hair transplant also works. Um, so, in African American hair, um, hair transplant is a little bit more challenging, but it can be done. Um, it is a little bit more challenging because there is a curl in the hair follicle itself, um, and it's hard to predict exactly where that curl um, is going to go underneath the scalp. So there can be a little bit more difficulty in the harvest of the hair, um, but it can be done. Um, in African-American uh, patients, I also caution um, and ask about any history of scarring. Um, so uh, if there's any history of keloids, hypertrophic scar, um, hyperpigmentation, hypopigmentation. Um, I also caution uh, caution these patients that, um, you know, we can do the follicular unit extraction. And the majority of time people will heal well, but you can um, end up with uh, hypopigmentation, which is a light color where every single little punch site was. Um, but it can be done. It is done. It is still a good option um, and it can it can really do a lot to help restore your hairline. Great. And one more another question. How much does stress or diet impact hair? Um, stress and diet can impact hair significantly. So, um, uh, talking about diet, um, the most uh, important aspect of your diet, I think, is your iron levels. Um, women uh, and men, but um, we see this a lot in women with low iron levels, um, can really have a lot of hair loss. So, iron is stored in the hair follicle itself. Um, when you're iron depleted, your body is going to pick up the iron from areas that they don't think are as important, and that includes the hair follicle. Um, when that happens, it's going to cause your hair to fall out. And so one of the labs that we check um, for patients who come in with hair loss, um, women especially, is your iron levels. If the iron levels are low, even if they're low normal, we like to um, recommend supplementing them to higher levels. Um, for women, we recommend supplementing more in the normal range for men, not women, but the normal range for men. Um, and again, it takes time for hair to grow, three to four months at least. Um, the hair follicles need to pick up the iron that you've resupplemented. Um, and so in, in that way, diet can really impact hair. Um, stress can also impact hair. Um, uh, the telogen effluvium is um, the global hair loss that you get um, that is induced by stress. Um, stress can be anything from difficulty at work, stress in jobs, um, or it could also be physical stress on the body um, from a recent infection. We like to ask if they had fevers before, if people had fevers before they noticed the global shedding. Um, and so, yes, yeah, stress and diet can impact your hair significantly. Okay, um, we have a comment. I used finasteride for about 12 years successfully, but in the later years developed severe brain fog and also impotence. I've been off for a number of years and the side effects went away, just an FYI. Oh, interesting. Thank you for sharing that comment with us. Um, another question, is the transplant procedure covered by insurance? No, unfortunately it's not covered by insurance. It's considered a cosmetic procedure. Um, and so uh, we'd love to see you in consultation um, if you would like to uh, find out about our pricing and our options. Um, we'd like to help you out as much as possible. Um, there is also a question about availability of the recorded presentation. And yes, we will have that available. We will post it on our, fa on our Facebook page, Instagram, and our website in a few days. We just have to edit it and, and package it so it looks good. Any final comments in the chats? Well, Dr. Cow, I think, um, oh, another question. Uh, how about shingles? I had it in 2005, had old shots, then those. 
um, what do you, um, I'm not sure what uh, you mean by old shots, um, but uh, if shingles leads to some scarring over the area that um, that it's involved or the, over the area that it affects, um, that can certainly damage the hair follicles. And so if you have um, hair loss specifically in the distribution of the shingles, um, you might have some scarring in that area. Um, I'd love to see you in clinic. Um, we don't typically transplant areas that are scarred, but um, if the inflammation has been burned out, uh, we can try transplant. Um, the hair that we transplant may not take super well. Um, and even if they do take, sometimes um, the hair can start falling out again in a few years. Um, but uh, it's certainly something willing to, we're willing to try um, if the conditions are correct. Great, well, I think that addressed everything in the chat. Dr. Cow, any last minute questions? Or comments. Um, yeah, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us again today. Um, those were excellent questions. Um, I hope to see you guys um, uh, if if you uh, desire for a free consultation and um, to help you guys in your hair journey in any way I can. But thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Cow. Thank you.